Hi, we're participating in EDGE's Paleo Rewind again, and we took the second half of April. Hopefully you're coming here from the April Part 1 video at Dinosaurs Will Always Be Awesome. If not, there is a link in the description. In the Grand Staircase Escalant National Monument in southern Utah is a site awesomely called the Rainbows and Unicorns Quarry, so named because it has abundant, diverse remains from a, a variety of animals from the Campanian stage of the Lake Cretaceous. In it, workers found four or five mostly complete individuals of a large Tyrannosaurid called Teratophonius. These specimens range in size and age from juvenile to large adult, but the remains are disarticulated. That's because it appears they were buried completely in a lake, but then varying water levels uncovered and reburied the bones, but didn't carry them away. For example, the, the ribs are still there, even though those should get washed away first. So this isn't a time-averaged aggregation. These animals all died at the same time. Why? There's evidence of a low-intensity, slow-moving fire at the site, but that's not the kind of fire that can kill multiple Tyrannosaurids. The authors couldn't rule out poisoning, but even cyanobacterial neurotoxicosis couldn't drop five Tyrannosaurids right next to each other. It takes a while for poisons to act. They wouldn't be clustered together like they are. Were they then forced together by a catastrophe, like what we saw with Allosaurus at the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry? Probably not. The rock is not suggestive of there having been a drought. So, by process of elimination, it appears that these animals all died in a flood. More importantly, since these were not artificially pushed together in life or in death, we have a signal of a mixed-age group of Tyrannosaurids living together. These are Teratophonius living as a family group or maybe as a cooperative hunting group. Taken together with similar finds for other taxa, including a track site from the Wapiti Formation that's going to be important in the next paper, it appears that right across Laramidia we have Tyrannosaurids from different times, places, and clades all living gregariously in some way. We had a paper modeling the locomotion of Tyrannosaurus rex, and they approached the topic in a clever way. Traditionally, modeling dinosaur locomotion, you start with the legs and work your way up, and you treat the tail more or less as a balancing rod. These authors treated the tail as a springy component and worked forward. They specifically looked at Trix the T-Rex, because that specimen preserves the ligament scars between the vertebra of the tail. and. As we have often pointed out, dinosaurs held their tails horizontally straight out, not dragging them. That passive suspension can store energy, and the dinosaur can release that energy whenever it takes a step because the tail muscles are pulling the leg back. The common analogy for this kind of thing, natural and resonant frequencies, is when you're on a swing and you're pumping your legs to keep going. If the T-Rex walking is the swing swinging, then the tail releasing its energy is you extending your legs at the right moment to propel you. If you do it at the wrong time, it's not going to do as much. Therefore, if you can model how frequently the tail bobs up and down, based on the stiffness of the segments and some math I won't pretend to understand, that gives you the timing of Tyrannosaurus' steps. For Trix, this happens every 1.52 seconds. That's our time, but how do we get distance? Well, we use that track site from the Wapiti Formation, scaled so that the footprints are the size of Trix's feet, and that gives us a step length of 1.94 meters. That works out to 4.6 kilometers per hour or 2.9 miles per hour. That may seem slow. Uh, it, it is, in fact, slower than the average human walking pace. But I'll point out that that is not top speed, that much less running speed. Uh, this is the preferred walking speed, just getting around as efficiently as possible. More importantly, because this method of modeling relies on a different set of assumptions than other approaches, it can be used as an independent line of evidence for checking results of those models. We got a description of some preserved skin from a Diplodocus in the Mother's Day Quarry in Montana. This is from the Morrison Formation, the Camarigian stage of the late Jurassic. Not a skin impression. This is the actual skin. It's a, a carbonaceous film preserving 3D relief of the scales as they existed in life. The authors think this was a small, young Diplodocus for a couple of reasons. Uh, all of the scales are small. The small scales can occur on large dinosaurs, but other diplodocid samples we have are several times larger. The individual scales are, are several times larger than what we see here. And from this same quarry, we have isolated bones from little diplodocus. We have the smallest skull we've ever found from a diplodocus. If you look at a figure of the sample, there's a rib 
from a small diplodocus running right through the sample, though that might not actually be from the same animal as the skin. If we had to trace this size off of an adult, we would expect just one type of scales to be represented, but from a little guy, more areas of the body are represented on you know, a few square feet. So much so that the authors think this was actually from a transitional area of the body, like where the belly transitions up into the back or where the neck meets the shoulder, something like that. There are small polygonal and pebble scales on what could have been the ventral part of the animal, that's the belly. There's also little isolated patches that were probably originally connected to the rest of the scrap. There's then a sharp border of mostly larger rectangular scales, which in one place appear to arch around the base of a limb, uh, in which case it was a small limb, something like 10 centimeters wide at its base. Further up, these give way to large polygonal and globular scales, with a few even larger ornamental ovoid and dome-shaped scales. Now, those ornamental scales all point the same way and interrupt the polygonal pavement, so those might be ornamenting the top of the animal, like in living reptiles. In 1992, Zherkos reported conical spines associated with a diplodocid tail. These Ovoid scales might be a variation of those, or even just a, a juvenile morph, like as the animal grew, they became taller. We don't know. But it would appear that Diplodocus had a variety of scales covering different parts of its body. A bunch of workers came together to look at the inner ears of archosaurs and their relatives, both living and extinct, and they found that the way we were using them to interpret the behavior of these animals was not great. The traditional view of these semicircular canals, is what they're called, is that in pterosaurs and birds, the size and shape is an adaptation for flight, whereas in crocodiles and lepidosaurs and turtles, the size and shape is the ancestral reptilian condition. Put that in quotes because birds are reptiles. Bird-like semicircular canals, which we should probably call pterosaur-like since they did it first, but eh. they show up in modern flightless birds as well as dinosaurs that are near birds but are not themselves able to fly. The authors think that it was actually the need for visual acuity and gaze stabilization and possibly the ability to run around that was driving semicircular canals to take on these shapes, not flight itself. As for crocodiles, it turns out Crocs actually convergently evolved this shape of inner ear alongside Lepidosaurs and turtles. We actually don't exactly know what the ancestral Sauropsid or Archosaur or semicircular canals looked like. The modern size and shape is also not directly correlated with aquatic or semi-aquatic behavior. It's actually just a result of their skulls flattening. Overall, this paper casts doubt on the practice of using the semicircular canals to infer behavior and ecology of extinct animals, which we have a tendency to do. For example, there's these two stem archosaurs, Trioptichus and Trilophosaurus, which both have pretty bird-like semicircular canals, which we would ordinarily, phylogenetically, expect to mean that they're running animals, they're cursorial. Both of these animals seemingly had sprawling limbs. One of them might have been a climber, but neither were runners. All of which is to say, semicircular canals are really interesting phylogenetically. There is definitely a deep split within Archosauromorpha, but using them to infer behavior and ecology is somewhat fraught. I'm also going to do a quick run-through of some discoveries that we don't have time to get into in depth. Workers found a large raven skull from a Pleistocene cave in Liaoning, China. This is the first clear record of the common raven lineage in that time and place. Also from Liaoning, this time from the late Cretaceous, we got a juvenile Eornith bird. Now, unlike in juvenile Enantorniths, this juvenile's arms were shorter than its legs and got relatively longer as they grew up. Dinosuchus is a famous giant crocodilian from the late Cretaceous of North America, and we have a new specimen from New Mexico. It could be as much as two million years older than the earliest Dinosuchus we'd found before this. We got a detailed description of Unenlagia, the parave from late Cretaceous of Patagonia. This corroborates that rather than dromaeosaurids proper, Unenlagians were more derived stem avialans. Workers described a new hadrosaurid from the end of the Cretaceous in Japan, Yamatosaurus. It looks more or less like a little Edmontosaurus, despite being much more basal. We got verification that some teeth from the Upper Cretaceous of Patagonia are Carcharodontosaurian. 
but all of the later occurring teeth in the paper are abelosaurid. This supports the idea that there was a turnover from Carcharodontosaurus to abelosaurus at the end of the Turonian. A species of titanosaur from the late Cretaceous of Brazil, previously called Aeolosaurus maximus, has been split off into its own genus, Aro de Titan. This is a somewhat more basal animal than its Argentinian relative. Another sauropod, Jara titanus, from the late Cretaceous of Uzbekistan, was reevaluated. It was previously considered a Rabachisaurid, but here it's recovered as a titanosaur, potentially a relative of the Lonchosaurs. That will about do it for April. Please check out the rewinds for May tomorrow. We will have links in the description. And check out the full rewind on EDGE's channel on New Year's Day. Happy holidays, and thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. We would like to send a special thank you to these individuals who have gone above and beyond to support this show. We could not have done it without you. Thank you.